Hi guys, my name is Tommy Cooksey and what I want to do real quick is just show you how a serverless architecture works and uh, walk you through a quick application that uses nothing but serverless. So before I do that, what I've done here is I've just kind of navigated to the home page for serverless architectures on AWS. And we just want to kind of quickly define what exactly does it mean when we say serverless architecture. So what we see here is serverless architecture is just basically the, ba the way that we can build an application without having to manage all of this infrastructure. So on AWS, a lot of times what you'll hear is what's called undifferentiated heavy lifting. And what we mean by that is we're removing those things that cost a lot for you to get done. Uh, as far as management and um, and taking care of those particular resources. And we want to go ahead and put that in as a service offering so that you can focus on doing what pays you back, right? So whatever particular uh, your business model looks at or what, whatever particular service your business model looks at, we want you to focus on that. That's what's paying back your customer and not so much focus on um, on on doing all the work of backing up the database or uh, managing the server or hiring a maintenance guy to come in and uh, uh, put in a new rack or something like that. that. That kind of work, those kind of tasks don't pay you back. And so what AWS does is they take that undifferentiated heavy lifting and they allow you to focus on what is important and they do that as a service offering. And so when we say serverless, it doesn't mean that there's not a server there. It simply means that they're managing that server for you and they're providing your access to that server through an exposed application programming interface or an API. So we're all probably pretty familiar with uh, standard APIs, but that's really all AWS is, is a set of well-defined APIs that we are simply using in order to interface with these service offerings that are available to us in the cloud that provide traditional computing that we would need for storage or compute or security or VPC or whatever it is that you need. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at an architecture uh, of small application that actually builds out from beginning to end everything that you would need in order to run the application and the servers are completely self-managed. There's nothing that we have to manage as far as bringing up a, a machine to run our node uh, JS or JavaScript or, or Python or uh, we don't have to have a back-end database server or anything like that. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what we are going to do here. And so I'm going to go ahead and sign into my, um, my console. And so after I get signed in here into my console, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and show you, first of all, the code that we're using in order to build this serverless, app serverless application. And so the code that we use to build this serverless application is uh, using what's called a YAML file. It's a, uh, a YAML stands for uh, YAML ain't markup language, and it's actually more declarative, but it, it's where you can define your entire architecture as code. So infrastructure as code, maybe we'll do a, 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 a talk about that some other time. Uh, but I'll walk you through that particular file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up uh, Visual Studio just so that I can show you the code for uh, for this particular infrastructure formation uh, stack. Uh, and then after we take a look at it, uh, then we'll go ahead and look at the application in, um, in the console. So let me open up this uh, cloud formation file. Give me one second here. So that's, here's what we'll do. We'll go. I'll, I'll go ahead and open it up here uh, since I don't already have that open. So I'm just going to go into CloudFormation. And I'll open that up and just copy it. I'm going to copy it out in Visual Studio because it's a little easier to read, to read the code in Visual Studio uh, than it is to read in... Um, in here in the cloud formation template. So anyway, this is uh, this is the code that I used in order to stand this up. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this code. There we go. So I'm going to copy this out into Visual Studio, and I'll show this to you guys. So what we're going to do here. And 
and I'm just going to call this uh, slots.yaml. And there's there's the file I was looking for. There it is. It's in my downloads directory. That's okay. Um, so when I uh, save this file out, this is uh, basically the um, uh, the uh, uh, cloud formation template that's used in order to stand up all these resources. If you're not familiar with what cloud formation is, cloud formation is basically a utility that allows you to utilize what's called a YAML file in order to define all of the resources that you're going to need for your architecture in a file. And so then you can use that file as the source to uh, stand up and create all of this architecture. So I'll show you kind of how that works. We'll, we'll demo this to a little bit, but that's not really the focus of this, dis this discussion. So anyway, um, in order for that tool to work, we have to kind of define um, some key things that the uh, the storage area basically is what we have to define uh, for the application where we've actually pre-staged some stuff and that's in an S3 bucket and so we have to just tell it what the name of our S3 bucket is and so that's just the uh, parameter that we put here at the beginning. Uh, then we have to define all of the resources that we need for our application to work. So uh, here the first thing that they create of course is going to be the uh, the, the storage area, which is the S3 bucket, and what they've done here is they've defined in this YAML file, basically it's just key value pairs, so we got, you know, the key, the, you know, so here we got bucket name, whatever that bucket name is, which is the string value that we've defined up here as an input parameter, so it's just referencing that input parameter. Um, and then you also see like uh, the index document. So one of the things that we all notice here is that if you work with S3 before, you can host a static website. So this is just saying that this is going to be hosted as a static website and the home page is index.html. So that's just what it's doing. It's just creating an S3 bucket that's going to be statically hosting a website. Sweet. So let's take a look at what's going to be going on in that bucket. So in that bucket, we are going to be hosting um, a bunch of files. And so these files are essence going to be our slot machine. And so um, in order for us to be able to interact with all of those files, we have to have the permissions. And so in addition to creating the bucket, we have to create all the permissions, which is another piece of this cloud formation template. So I went ahead and uh, defined all of the stuff that I need for my security. So here is what we call a policy statement. And a policy statement just basically defines uh, the effect, the action, the resource, and the principle uh, that has the ability to access um, things in AWS. So it's basically the security piece. Uh, so um, here we just define the security uh, for that. So we say, hey, we're going to allow get so you can read out of this bucket. That's kind of cool. And then who can read? Well, anybody can read. Sweet. So we've defined that. So then we come in here and then we see this thing called a Cognito um, identity pool. <clears throat> and so if you're not familiar with Cognito, what Cognito is, is it's basically the way that we can uh, build out uh, the security chunks. So basically uh, creating the, um, the authorizations uh, and the authentications uh, and grouping them together uh, for web and mobile applications uh, and, cr and, and creating that uh, in a structure that allows us to define rules on how you would get auth authorized into uh, our resources. And so, um, so anyway, Cognito here is just saying that we're going to allow unauthenticated identities. So basically, you don't have to go out and, and get a certificate from your, uh, or get logged in through uh, your local LDAP or OAuth or anything like that, or you don't have to have an account in AWS in order to be able to access this, this Git uh, you'll be able to do that just as an anonymous user. And so that's what we're doing. And then, uh, and so then the next piece is your, we have is, so now we've set up kind of some of the security. And so the next piece that we have here is we have this role. And if you're not familiar with what a role is in AWS, is a role is basically where we can temporarily assign the permission. So we set those permissions up and then we have to temporarily assign them. So where are we temporarily assigning them to? Well, we're assigning them actually to the compute. Uh, and so the compute is actually a Lambda function. If you're not familiar with what a Lambda function, it's basically where we don't have to manage the servers. And so I'll talk about this a little bit more, um, you know, as we go through our lecture today. Uh, but, but a Lambda function is just serverless compute. All you do is upload your code and then you just, you can call that code anytime you want. It just needs to make sure that it's asynchronous code. So, uh, with that being said, um, what we see here is we have a Lambda function, 
okay, that's going to get this, this, this role that we're creating is going to be called the Lambda role. And this service, this Lambda service is going to be able to assume this role. Okay. And so this role, the Lambda execute ro execution role is going to give them the ability to execute the code that they're going to be calling. And so they, they need to be able to have the rights to do that. And so that's what this role is doing. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, that's for the identity pool. Uh, and so then uh, we've kind of created the identity pool. And so now we need to actually add the permissions to invoke that Lambda. Um, and so then we have this, uh, this additional uh, um, uh, slot machine unauth unauthenticated principal AWS stack name role name that we create uh, that is going to allow the web identity to invoke our Lambda function. All right. And so lots of permissions that we have to set up here. And so then we have the allow invoke function, which is here that's allowing the unauthenticated principal role, which is what we were talking about earlier, to call the Lambda function so that they can do that without us knowing who they are. And so that's what we're doing here. And so now we're attaching that role to the identity pool. So you have to attach the role to the identity pool, and that's what they did here. And so then now we actually have the code. So this this first part, you know, if you're not if it's kind of I tried I went through it kind of fast, but basically all that is is just about setting up all the security that you need in order to be able to use the application. Sweet. So now we're into the actual application itself. And so if we look here, this is going to be a slot machine. And so imagine if you're pulling the handle on the slot machine, you want some randomness to occur. And so this is our code that creates the randomness and displays on a wheel, on a slot machine wheel, uh, some various different um, images that will tell us whether or not we're a winner. And so let's take a look at that code. And so when we look here, we see that it is a Lambda function. And so when we think about a Lambda function, as I mentioned before, it's serverless compute. So remember, serverless means serverless, it means that I'm not managing that Node.js server. I'm not managing that EC2 instance. I'm not managing a, a container. I'm not managing anything. I'm just simply calling the Lambda function. Sweet. So <clears throat> what we've done here is we've simply created a, a, a function uh, called slot pull. And here's our description of it. And in order for that function to work, well, it's going to be doing compute. So if it's going to be doing compute, we have to kind of basically define uh, the um, ceiling for the amount of resources that we're going to use for compute. So when we use compute, we use memory and we use computing time. So we got the next two things that we have is how much memory are we going to use? So a, a Lambda function is actually limited to 128 megs of memory. So that's what we're using here. But if you wanted to scope that down, you could have that uh, that particular Lambda run less than 128 or up to 128 megs of memory. Uh, Lambda can run for up to 15 minutes. So if, you're, if your function that you're building, the code runs for longer than 15 minutes, you're going to have to chunk that down so that it runs in less than 15 minutes or else it will time out. Okay. So the next thing that we see here is what we're doing is it's going to go ahead and have a role assignment. Uh, and so that remember earlier, we're talking about the role. So it's going out and it's looking for that role assignment in order to be able to run, you know, for this, for this Lambda function that will be assigned to this Lambda function so that it will have the appropriate permissions to do what is inside of the Lambda. So, then we see the runtime environment. So the interesting thing about lambdas is they'll run in a lot of different environments. You could run Python code, you could run Node.js, uh, you could run Java, uh, Go. Uh, I don't remember some of the other ones. But there's about five different languages, and, I'll, and, I'll, and and you can take a look at those. And if you'd like, I can show you where that homepage is. Um, okay, so that's where we see the runtime environment, and then we see the handler. Of course. That's going to be the handler that's handling the code that we're uploading. And we're going to upload that code in a zip file. So that's what we see down here. Uh, and so then in that zip file, you know, we have a, a variable that is going to be used for our face cards. And so in that zip file, we're uploading a lot of different PNG files, which are just the graphics that are showing us the king of hearts, the ace of spades, whatever. And, um, and then that's going to be the randomness that we'll have in our, um, in our slot machine. Sweet. And so then here is going to be kind of the handler that's going to be doing the callback function 
that's going to actually hold the data values that gets returned to the slot wheel, right? So when we look at the slot wheel, you know, you got a left wheel, a middle wheel, and a right wheel, and then it's just referencing those files that we looked at up here. All right, and so then here we notice that the, we actually added in another step function here that basically just increased our odds. Uh, and, and we didn't, I haven't shown you how the odds work yet, but this is basically just increasing those odds in order to every three polls you, you got better odds, right? So it's giving you, I think, 33% better odds uh, whenever you do every three polls. So, um, and then here it's just going to set a random number for each slot position, and then it's going to basically this is how it creates the math to figure out what the results are going to be, and so that's what you see here. Uh, and then next we see that uh, we have another little cool little conditional statement that just kind of tells us if they all of the slot wheels match up, then then it's true that we're a winner, um, and then um, then we can do uh, re we return those results back out in a callback function. Um, so that's pretty simple, pretty simple little uh, set of code there for our JavaScript. And then, so that's that's actually kind of the nuts and bolts of our application, you know, so that's the brains of it. So, you know, if you think about, you know, think about any application, you know, you got to have, you got, you got in any, any computing, you got to have storage, you got your storage subsystem, you got your compute subsystem. So we, we talked about compute. Uh, just then, and we talked about storage with our S3 bucket, and then you have security, which was all of that permission stuff, and then you have networking, right? And so this is how everything kind of communicates, right? So then, um, and that's built in because we're doing it in the VPC, and we're recognizing these objects based on their Amazon resource name. Um, so the next thing that I see here is I see how did we actually set this up, right? So, so in order for this application to get built out, well, we got to build out the content from the data that's already in that S3 bucket, right? So we pre-staged everything in that bucket, and then we use that bucket in order to kind of build out our app. Sweet. So, um, so here is the actual Lambda function that builds the app. And so instead of it being in JavaScript, like what we saw before, this one's in Python, and it's using 128 megs of memory, but instead of only having four minutes of timeout, it's taking 15 because it's doing the setup. So it's gonna take a little longer for this to run than other than just pulling the slot machine, right? Uh, so then here's our code, just showing us how it's basically importing from our zip file, getting our JSON, um, importing our memes, <clears throat> and then it's uh, printing loading your function, and then it's creating a Lambda, uh, and it's going out and it's you know, doing some dumps and it's setting up uh, basically our architecture, unzipping everything into the web directory, um, uh, defining our S3 uh, boot client, um, checking our re request type, whether or not it's an update or if it's a delete, what, what, what it is that we're doing right now. And it's basically just setting up our application. And so, uh, I don't want to spend too much time about that and that. And then it kind of gets into um, our security again. So here's just, again, the security pieces. Uh, and, then, um, and then lastly, we have another little security piece that's just allowing, uh, let's see, we're doing an allow for, uh, for our log group. So we want to make sure that we have kind of a log of everything that's happening. And so this is just going into our log groups and allowing the S3 uh, um, bucket to have puts, lists, and deletes into it. Uh, for any resource that wants to call into that log group to log function information. Sweet. So then we have the um, the uh, custom web content right here, um, and so this is where we're actually downloading all of this stuff from. And so we're actually getting it from another S3, but or actually we're getting it from a GitHub repository. So we're just pulling this in from this GitHub repository out here. And it's just putting, this is the actual zip file that, that we pull in in order to uh, download all of our, our, our resources. Um, and then here's our logs. So this is where we're putting all of our log information. So for our S3 logs uh, and our CloudWatch logs. And then lastly, the last thing that we see is we get an output. This is going to be a URL. Okay, cool. Well, let's see it. All right. So when we come out here and we look in CloudFormation, so here I am in CloudFormation, and here's my little application that I built out. And so, um, if you wanted to see kind of when I built this out, you can kind of see that you know that that you know here's the stack info when it was actually built out uh, using this, this utility called CloudFormation. And then you can see any events that happened as it was creating all of those objects. You can see that if it failed, I would see how you know where I was at. I can actually see all of those resources. So again, you know, I can see you know the policies, the log groups, the um, the roles. 
uh, the um, lambda functions, you know, I can see everything that we just looked at that was in there. I can see all of those individual resources that got generated. There was 14 of those that got generated, and there they are individually, and I can kind of look at each one of those resources that got created inside my account. Then if I come over here, I can see the, you know, of course I can see the outputs of this, right? So there that is. And then um, there's that template that we just walked through, of course, in Visual Studio. Uh, and then, you know, my input parameters is like I showed you at the beginning is I needed to know what the name of the slot machine um, um, S3 bucket was. So I had to define that as an input value because that was an object that was being referenced as part of my, my configuration uh, template. And so I did that and then, um, and then it created this freaking awesome slot machine. So let's check it out. So I come over here. Oh, look out. Check it out. I got a slot machine. And I click the button, dun, 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 and then there it is, right? And so, you know, you can come in here and you can inspect the code, whatever you can do, inspect element, and you can come in and you can kind of peruse through this and you can kind of see, um, you know, it, it, it looks like it's having a problem with that return code that um, tell me if I'm a winner or not. But, um, but anyway, you can come in here and you can kind of take a look of, you know, all those resources that, you know, that uh, I uploaded. You can kind of see, you know, these are everything. Um, um, you can also go in and kind of just... Uh, take a look through the code if you want to, um, you know, whatever you want to do. But basically, again, uh, this is a completely serverless application. And so um, the important thing that we want to remember here is that when we hear serverless, uh, it just means that I'm not managing all that stuff, right? So I've had this application up and running since like November or something, and I don't do anything with it. I don't, I don't do nothing. I just demo with it. That's it. Um, and so so anyway, that's, that's real quick. Um, so... Just to kind of review and take a step back, and then we'll go through and answer some of your guys' questions, because I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Um, so quickly, is is when we think about serverless, all serverless means is, is that we are simply taking all of the work that we are used to doing as, as an, an administrator or a, a sysadmin or a DBA, and we're trying to scale that, right? So we're creating an environment so that we're not necessarily paying for that. Now, here's the important thing to remember is many times you might think, well, wait a minute, I'm a DBA and I'm already doing this and I want to be cost effective. Well, if you're managing it, you're going to be much more cost effective than you're going to be using this as serverless. So let me give you, let me explain what I mean by that. If I were to have a server that was going to run a piece of code all day, every day, it's going to be more cost effective for me to manage that server than for me to use that as a Lambda function. However, if that same server only got called five times a day, 10 times a day, 100 times a day, whatever, that might be easier and more cost effective for me to use that as a Lambda and not have to manage that underlying server and then I can focus my attention on something else. And so again, all the, 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 when we say serverless, whether it be, you know, compute uh, with a Lambda function, whether it be storage with Aurora relational database or DynamoDB, non-relational, NoSQL database, all of those services, you know, persistent storage, uh, you know, compute, um, though Cognito, which is allowing me to do serverless management of my users, security, so in essence, what I've done is, is I've taken those core pieces that I need in order to do computing and I've said, hey, I'm going to not manage that. I'm going to focus my attention on something else and let this be managed as a service offering and then I'll just ensure that I have that capability as a service offering. I'm not managing it. AWS is managing it and I'll call it when I need it. And so that's basically what serverless does for us is it just removes all that undifferentiated heavy lifting so that we can focus on what matters. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I definitely will be uh, answering lots of questions for you guys, but uh, that's basically what serverless does for us. So what kind of questions do you guys got?